Thank you, all the organizers. Um, <coughs> it's over there. Okay, so I'll be uh, indeed uh, discussing uh, different methods to infer or <coughs> learn network from large scale data. And I will insist on uh, uh, <coughs> these networks to be interpretable. And uh, as you will see, we'll discuss about multivariate information and biological and eventually clinical data as well. <coughs> but uh, okay, but before uh, I start, let me thank, uh, <coughs> in case I forget at the end, uh, all the students and postdocs who worked on this uh, topic with me uh, over the years. So it started uh, some years ago now with uh, Parham, Severine, then Louis, and more <coughs> uh, uh, than uh, Nadia, uh, and more recently, uh, Vincent, Hongao and Marcel. <clears throat> um, so what is uh, network uh, learning, network uh, reconstruction? Uh, uh, so as you uh, know already, I'm sure, this is the, the, the problem of starting with some data uh, where, uh, for instance, uh, some interesting variables, uh, which might be gene expressions or all sort of data, as we will see <clears throat> in the lecture. Uh, are measured in different um, experiments. So you have a number of samples in rows and a variable of interest in uh, columns. And the whole idea is uh, through uh, some sort of uh, method or and typically algorithm, you'd like to reconstruct some graphical models of this uh, data. <coughs> so. In fact, wh why do we want to build uh, graphical models like this? Is because if you typically pick any variables or pair of variables at random, they will all or typically be uh, um, correlated to some extent. So basically, you would like to, you should draw a line between all these uh, different variables, and that will give you a complete network, a complete graph where all these uh, variables are connected, <clears throat> but indeed, this is not really what you're interested in. What you would like to, to, to know is what are the direct connections between uh, these uh, variables. Most of these correlations that you observed in data, they are not due to direct connections, but rather indirect path uh, uh, between uh, those variables. So that's the, the, the aim of the game, it's to learn the graphical models where all the links are direct connections. <clears throat> and when you do this, uh, you, you may also be interested in uh, uh, trying to learn uh, the type of uh, uh, connections between those variables, whether this is in particular causal or non-causal uh, uh, connections. Uh, <clears throat> so when it's causal, you'd like to put uh, uh, arrowhead on these edges, and when it's uh, not, uh, in principle, you don't have uh, arrowheads, just uh, edges, undirected edges. And um, in fact, most methods uh, that try to learn this graph, <coughs> in fact, they have to uh, assume beforehand the type of network they'd like to reconstruct. So either a causal network, like in this example, where all the edges are, will be directed or uh, you know, undirected network or Markov network. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, if you assume it beforehand, uh, you, you don't really learn uh, uh, this uh, uh, causal uh, nature from the data. Uh, and, and so this is a kind of a problem. Um, <clears throat> so as you will see uh, in the, by the end of um, the, the lecture, um, there, there are a number of, of methods uh, that uh, uh, can, in fact, learn the causal nature between those variables directly from the data, so they don't have to assume it beforehand. And that's uh, the method that uh, we worked, we, we've developed, that I will describe uh, later on, uh, where using the exact same algorithms, you can uh, reconstruct uh, either, uh, you know, mainly causal uh, network. Here, it's uh, between the uh, uh, expression level of uh, 
transcription factors. So that's uh, indeed we know that they, this is a kind of causal relations between those genes. Some are regulated other genes and not vice versa. And the exact same algorithm can also look at uh, uh, other type of data <coughs> here that are uh, protein contact maps. So here you, you in fact looked not at the expression level of uh, some uh, genes, uh, like in this case, but here you look at the sequence of those genes that have been uh, aligned. <coughs> and if you have enough uh, sequences, meaning 10 of thousands typically, uh, uh, you, you can learn from the covariations of uh, some, some uh, uh, <coughs> residues and at given positions. When they covary, it typically means that uh, you know, they have something, uh, uh, um, they have some connections, and in fact, it, it maps onto the uh, protein structure at the end. And in this case, these uh, the same algorithms that I'll describe later on, uh, in fact, reconstruct a, a graph, in, in that case, a protein structure, without, that, that tell you that there is no causality in this uh, particular example. Uh, and here, indeed, uh, naively, you expect that these protein-protein contacts are more or less symmetric, although there are also uh, exceptions that actually might be uh, quite interesting. <coughs> Okay. Um, okay, but before that, uh, since this is a school, uh, let's try to uh, uh, give you some background. <coughs> so it all fits on one slide. Um, how to learn graphical models from uh, observational data. Uh, so I'll describe three main approaches. Uh, the first one is uh, search and score methods. <coughs> Uh, typically for Bayesian uh, graphs. So here the idea is to maximum, so maximize some uh, score, which is called the likelihood, that I'll define uh, precisely uh, later on. And uh, uh, so in that case, you, you are able to uh, uh, compute the score, the, the, this likelihood, for any graph. So given the data, you get some uh, random graph, uh, maybe to start with, and then you, you can estimate this score, and then you change this graph, flipping an edge or adding an edge, removing an edge, recompute the score, and uh, then uh, if uh, this uh, second graph has a higher score, it's more likely. Uh, so in principle, you will this way uh, try all networks if you can, uh, and then you pick the, the one or the few ones that have the maximum score. Uh, so it's a nice method, it actually works very well. The, the, although obviously there are some issues, and the, the main issue is that uh, you know, as soon as you have more than 10 or so uh, uh, properties, nodes, you can't really uh, you know, enumerate all of them. And so in that case, you have to resort to uh, heuristics. And, but these heuristics have been developed and they, they work quite, quite nicely, actually. Uh, another restriction is, uh, is that obviously at the end, you only have uh, directed edges. That's what I mentioned initially. You have to assume that the, the, the class of graph is a, is a Bayesian graph, actually. So that's for the first method. Uh, second method, yes? Sorry, uh, are we allowed to interrupt? Sure. Uh, when you say the likelihood, do you mean the likelihood in a general sense? Because if you look at increasing the likelihood, the complete graph is going to be your best model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll come to the, this point exactly uh, in a few slides. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so the second method. Uh, is uh, quite different. Uh, it, it's related to looking at these uh, correlations that we mentioned initially. So you look at the you know, variance, the covariance of uh, different variables. And then, so that defines your metric sigma. And this uh, metric sigma, uh, there is a kind of a magic trick. Uh, <clears throat> we said all the, the nodes are connected, so this metric sigma is kind of full uh, matrix. Uh, but when you invert it, um, 
it gives you something that is essentially the connectivity of this graph. So it gives you something that is uh, typically much uh, sparser, where uh, L is the Laplacian matrix, and D is some diagonal matrix, and A is the um, connectivity matrix. <coughs> so the inverse of the variance covariance matrix gives you essentially the contacts. Um, <coughs> So obviously this is a, a result that uh, has uh, some assumptions in it, and, and the main assumption is that uh, uh, you, you have to assume that the, these correlations are, are due to a linear, uh, um, um, prop, uh, linear um, um, coupling between those variables. Um, so as you, as you see in, in this second example, I did not, uh, recover the same graph as before. This is because indeed when you assume that, so in this, in this approach you assume basically that there is no uh, orientations um, <clears throat> in, in, the, in the underlying graph. So that's, that's what this uh, method uh, assumes as well. And uh, as you see here we have one extra edge, so obviously we don't have orientation, and we, we have one extra edge uh, in the middle. <clears throat> So if the true graph, generating graph, was the, the top one, say, uh, in this example, we'll, not only we will miss the orientation, but we will also have to add some links. <clears throat> what I should say is that uh, the, the reverse is uh, also true. If uh, the true uh, graph was undirected, say, uh, uh, if, this, if uh, the true graph was the same, skeleton, the same edges without orientation, and then we'll try to learn it uh, with this Bayesian approach, we'll, we'll also have to add edges. <clears throat> so, okay, that, that's the, the limits of these uh, methods. Um, in, in addition, there are, there are uh, uh, serious problems in, in, uh, to invert uh, this uh, variance covariance metric because you basically it has to be invertible, which is typically not the case. Uh, and then there, there, so you have some tricks that helps you invert these uh, matrices. Yes? Are there simple uh, coefficient for Right, this, this is what I, I call the, the linear, ah. linear assumption, yeah. Um, okay, and at the end, uh, as uh, I said already, you only have uh, undirected edges. <clears throat> so that's part of the assumption. Uh, and uh, okay, so in addition to those uh, methods, there are other methods uh, uh, called the constraint-based uh, approach <clears throat> um, that have this nice property to, uh, in principle, being able to recover a much broader class of graph. Uh, that includes undirected, directed, and or uh, bidirected edges that I will describe later on. So these methods, they are, again, quite different. Um, in this case, you start from a complete graph. <coughs> um, so all uh, um, nodes are connected initially, and then the idea is to remove as many of those edges as possible by looking for conditional independence. Uh, <clears throat> the idea being that uh, uh, if I can find two nodes that become conditionally independent on some other nodes, then it means that I, I don't really need this uh, direct edge because I can explain all the correlations in the data through indirect path in my graph, okay? Um, okay, so let's assume again that the, the true graph in this example is the top one, this one, and now we'll try to find it with this uh, approach, constraint-based approach. Um, <clears throat> so now, uh, I'll, so obviously, uh, as you realize, uh, I need to remove two edges between T and Z and X and UI. Um, so these two edges, I can remove them because uh, between X and Y, I get uh, uh, independence. So this is the notation for independence. I get independence, independence condition on the variable T. Because as, as you see, if this is the true graph, uh, 
there is some, the only way the information goes from X to UI is through a T. Um, because Z is uh, just downstream of X and Y. So there is no really information uh, passing from X to Y through uh, Z. <coughs> so if I condition on, on T, um, then I find that uh, X and Y are independent condition on T. And I can remove this edge. So the second edge that, that I can remove is, that I have to remove is T, Z. And for this, in, in this case, as you see, uh, here I have uh, information uh, flowing between T and Z uh, through UI. And also some correlations come from the fact that T and Z uh, have a common um, <coughs> ancestor or common regulator, X. So I really have to condition on two nodes now, okay? To find the conditional independence. And, and then I can also remove the second edge. So at this stage, I find something that is called the skeleton. So that's the same graph as above. So that's the true uh, uh, skeleton, but without orientation at, the, uh, at this stage. <coughs> So then there is a second step, <coughs> which is trying to orient uh, some of these edges, uh, the edges of this uh, skeleton here. And the way uh, one does it is by looking back at the conditional independence, and, and in particular, the, what we call the separating set, so the nodes that were included in the separating set <coughs> that explain the conditional independence. Uh, and whenever we find a, 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 another node Z uh, that is neighbor of uh, X and Y, of a pair, uh, and not included in the separating set, so in, in that case, uh, I remind you that the separating set contain only one node T. So Z is neighbor of X and Y and not included in the separating set. So in that case, what it really means is that Z cannot be a, a, you know, a cause of either X or Y, <coughs> because otherwise we would have to include it in the separating set. So basically we learned that Z has somehow to be at the tip of a, 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 a network motif that is called a V structure. So that, that's when you have two arrows that are pointing towards a, a node, while the, the base of this three-point motif is uh, not connected. Right, so that's uh, the second step of this method. And then, um, <coughs> in fact, there is also a third step, but for this I need to uh, complexify a little bit my, net, my example here. So I need to add uh, one extra edge downstream of this V structure. <coughs> um, because now this extra edge, uh, I'll see that uh, depending on how I orient uh, this edge, I will either create a new V structure or, uh, or not, <clears throat> and since um, in the true graph there is no additional V structure because it's pointing towards uh, W, um, <clears throat> if it was pointing the other way, I would have found it at the, you know, the second step where I find a V structure. So since it's not a V structure, uh, for consistency uh, reasons with the, the, the assumptions of the methods, you, uh, in fact, are allowed to orient these uh, downstream edges towards W. Uh, all right, and that's basically, uh, that's, that's it. Um, but as you realize, this uh, graph that we reconstructed using this approach is not exactly the same as the, the, the true graphs that we use to generate the data. So they are edges that are uh, undirected. <coughs> and the reason they are undirected is that uh, at the level of uh, observational data, so if you're not allowed to do experiments, basically, to test this uh, graph, you only rely on uh, you know, observed data, <coughs> then um, there is nothing in this data that, can, that, that tells you how to orient those edges. They can be uh, any, anywhere or even undirected, as uh, shown here, uh, as long as you don't create a new V structure. Okay, 
Um, so that's called that's called the Markov equivalent graphs. Um, okay, so that's that's what this method allow you to to reconstruct, and you can also ha have uh, bidirected edges that we'll discuss in a second. <coughs> uh, so in principle, they they they, they are very nice uh, method as you realize, um, but they also have some issues. Uh, one is uh, interpretability, as we will see in a second, and uh, another major issue is that they, they are really sensitive to sampling noise. So, in practice, they don't really work uh, that well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, discuss this uh, a bit more in detail. Um, so, this is the uh, scheme of these uh, constraint-based methods. <clears throat> so, they date back from the you know, early 90s with uh, uh, interesting improvements uh, much more recently. There are in three steps that we describe, so I, I, won't, I won't detail them again. Um, <clears throat> but then, uh, in fact, they, 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 they have some interpretive problem, uh, as we will see uh, right after this, this slide, because they, are, they have inconsistent separating set. Uh, and so recently, we, we introduced some modification on these algorithms to tackle this uh, problem. And the, the second major issue is the robustness, lack of uh, robustness, because they are really sensitive to the sampling noise or the finite size of the data set. And for this, we've developed uh, over the, the, the year a number of uh, um, approaches that uh, improved uh, on, on this aspect. <clears throat> um, so what, what is this uh, problem of uh, interpretability? So uh, if you remember, when we want to build a network, basically at the end we would like to look at this graph and be able to infer something, and in particular infer indirect effects between variables and direct effects between variables. Um, and the problem is uh, these methods typically uh, don't really work uh, too well. Um, the, the reason is that when you're pruning, you know, in the first step, you're pruning this graph, so you're removing edges based on, um, you know, finding this conditional independency. But you're pruning, pruning this uh, graph uh, iteratively. So what may uh, or may not have been uh, 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 correct when you remove this edge is typically no, no longer correct at the end where you removed uh, many edges. Uh, so in, in this uh, cartoon example, for instance, I decided to remove the edge between two and, and, and six by conditioning on three. So maybe when I did it, it was fine. Maybe not, actually. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know, at the end of the day, when I removed uh, most of these edges, uh, clearly I, I, I can't explain uh, 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 the conditional independence between two and six, conditioning on three, looking at this graph, because there is no path indirect path between two and six through uh, three. <clears throat> so, although you know, statistically it's kind of uh, correct, the decision that I made uh, early on, uh, I can't really see it on my graph. That's kind of a problem. Um, the, the, the main problem can also occur at the, the orientation level. For instance, I could have removed uh, the age between three and six by conditioning on one. Uh, but then, you know, when I look at my final graph, I realize that uh, it's something wrong because one is really downstream of uh, three and six, so I, in principle, it shouldn't work. <coughs> uh, all right, so that's, that's, the, that, that's the issue. So what, what we propose to improve on this is to sort of iterate uh, this algorithm. <coughs> um, so, once you've done it once, uh, the idea is you go back um, to the beginning or maybe to the step where you remove the edge without conditioning. So without conditioning is no, not, not much problem. So here there is all the edges that I need to condition on something to be removed. Uh, <clears throat> so now I will, I will try in the second iteration, I'll try to remove these edges but condition on the fact that uh, I'm allowed to do it from the uh, first uh, network that I found in the first iteration, okay? So I can 
in, in, enforce this uh, consistency either at the level of the final graph including orientation or, or also at the intermediate graph without orientation. So there are, there are two strategies to do that. It's difficult to say which one is the best. It really depends on the case-to-case -case basis. Um, okay, but that that's basically guarantees that at the end uh, you obtain something that is uh, consistent that you can look at and, and try to infer, uh, interpret in, 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 in some uh, reasonable way. And obviously for applications, as you will <coughs> see eventually uh, towards the end of the talk, uh, that's exactly what you want. You want to be able to infer something from this uh, network structure. <coughs> Yet, once you fix this problem, there, there remains a serious problem, which is the robustness or the lack of uh, robustness against uh, sampling noise. <coughs> um, so, but before uh, addressing this, this point, uh, let me define a bit uh, uh, in more detail the class of graphs that we are interested in, yes? Slide, yeah. Uh, can you do this uh, when you have a lot of nodes, for example, a thousand, because that's the time consuming for the Bayesian class? Yes, yes. No, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, uh, so there, there, there are different questions. Even for this uh, approach, uh, this approach are not so. Uh, uh, efficient, I would say. On paper, they are. I mean, there are there are theorems that tells you that, uh, uh, in typical case, this is a um, kind of a polynomial algorithm. <clears throat> in the worst case, that's uh, exponential, but it's it's not it's not uh, it's not so. Um, the point is when when it works when when the method is. Uh, correctly uh, uh, reconstructed some graph, it does it rather fast, typically. When it gets lost, and we'll discuss that uh, in more detail, it's not only uh, giving you a wrong uh, graph, but it also takes forever uh, <laughs> to rebuild this graph. Yeah. Um, yes? Do you, have, do you also have some condition that guarantee that you always end up to the same graph? So there's some kind of uniqueness of the best solution? Or does it depend really on the order in which Right, so uh, yes, so th th there is a problem on the order, uh, but that was fixed uh, in, this, in this paper. So actually for 25 years, uh, it's quite kind of amazing, this, this method was really order dependent. So if you will relabel your, your uh, variables, you'll get a different answer. <clears throat> People even use that to, to try to uh, uh, um, probe the robustness of their, of their reconstruction. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so there, there is a small, uh, simple trick that uh, make it fully deterministic. So you always get the same answer, whatever the names or the order of your variable. Um, okay, so um, the, the graph we'll be interested in are, are you know, and this very broad class of graph that can contain uh, three type of edges, a directed, uh, undirected, directed, and bidirected. So uh, we already uh, um, uh, learned about these structures that are these uh, three-point uh, motifs with two arrows pointing towards the middle node. Uh, <clears throat> now imagine I add a fourth uh, node, W, um, but W has this, the same V structure uh, statistics uh, um, with U, I, and Z. So it means that, uh, you know, Z and W are independent, uh, and yet they are both uh, connected to uh, U, I. And so, basically, I need to uh, put uh, two arrowheads pointing towards uh, U, I. U, I is not the cause of W nor uh, Z. <coughs> so, as, as you see in this, uh, in this uh, new motifs with four nodes, uh, have two V structures that basically share the middle edge. And what it means is that uh, uh, everything is, looks as if there was, a, a, you know, unobserved, unmeasured variables, L, uh, 
uh, that uh, basically is the cause of both Z and UI. Okay? So in principle, these graphs, they also allow for these latent unobserved variables uh, uh, to be uh, uh, inferred through the causal relations they, they uh, uh, create on the observed variable Z and, and UI in that case. <coughs> Um, okay, so the, the, the reason these methods have uh, some lack of robustness, as, as we said, is uh, they are twofold. So the, the, the first reason, as you realize on this uh, cartoon, um, with these uh, three steps, is that we start, as we said, from the complete graph, so we start really far from the final graph, which is uh, hopefully very sparse. So basically, along this process, we, we need to remove almost all edges. And so there are many decisions to be taken, and uh, along the way you'll make errors, inevitably. <coughs> and the, the real problem is are the early errors. So if I remove an edge early on that I should have kept, one of the few edges that I should have kept, um, then later on I will need to keep edges that I should remove. So I have this snowball effect where you know, early errors will uh, snowball into uh, uh, hundreds of errors at the end. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> and um, this problem is uh, even more acute because in fact early on, making mistakes early on is, a, is it's a, you know, very simple in fact, um, because trying to find conditional, so trying to find conditional dependencies is to basically uh, uh, you know, slice your data uh, in small pieces and trying to look on these small pieces whether you have uh, independencies. So um, each time I condition on an additional variable, uh, if this variable has uh, 10 levels, I will cut my you know, 1,000 sample um, data set into 10 pieces, more or less, for each value of the condition variable, and then I will see on these 100 uh, subset uh, on these um, 100 uh, sample uh, subsets whether uh, my variable my uh, uh, variable x and y are um, independent <coughs> and each time I add a, 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 a another conditional variable I, I slice my data even more so if I have two variables conditioning variables with 10 levels I go on average from 1,000 samples to 10 samples, subsamples on which I, I look at the condition independent. So at the end of the day, when I slice my data too much, you know, I can find whatever. It's basically noise. Uh, so trying to find conditional independency at the beginning is uh, really trying to guess something that is uh, close to noise, <coughs> which obviously is a, uh, is, uh, uh, makes the methods very sensitive to this uh, uh, sampling noise and, and finding size effect. So in order to improve on this aspect, we'll, we'll basically need to uh, prevent these uh, early errors. And we'll do that based on information theory. Um, <clears throat> let me see. I'm doing on time. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'll try to give you another uh, one slice primer for the school on information theory. I think on this one I, I cheated a little bit. I think it's two slides. Two, two, two slides. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we'll first define the likelihood, um, and I'll answer your question in a, in a second. Um, <clears throat> so let's imagine we have uh, n samples. Uh, which we assume are all independent, uh, and they all come from uh, you know, an unknown uh, distribution P. So we have N draws from this uh, unknown distribution. <clears throat> and what we'll try to see is whether we can model this data with some you know, theoretical uh, probability distribution Q. Um, so the question we ask really is to, what is the probability of this particular sequence of uh, observation, x1 to xn, to come from a Q? 
instead of uh, P, which is uh, unknown. So we'll basically ask, uh, you know, what is the probability, uh, this joint probability of Q1, Qn, uh, in this probability Q. <clears throat> um, so that, that's what we call the likelihood. So this, uh, in fact, when n come, becomes uh, large enough, so if you really observe a lot of data, um, in fact, the result, uh, asymptotically, uh, will lead to something that, in fact, does not really depend on this particular sequence. That's, that's the, the magic. Uh, it only depends on this p, uh, which you don't know, and, and the q, <clears throat> and through uh, something that is called the cross entropy. Um, and that is defined like this. Um, and you can also uh, uh, split this uh, cross entropy into two pieces. One is the Shannon entropy, uh, and one is the kullback leibler divergence. <coughs> so that's the central uh, result, really. And um, in fact, you can prove this uh, result in one line. Um, so let's uh, take the, you know, 1 over n log of this uh, q, of this uh, likelihood. If all these samples are independent, uh, um, this uh, joint probability should be the product of uh, uh, point-wise probabilities. And so in the log, you get the sum. And here, as you realize, this is just the average of uh, log q over all samples, OK? Um, so now, if you have many, many samples, this should roughly be the same as, uh, so this average, you can do it either by summing over all samples or just looking at the distribution and summing over all levels of this distribution with a weight that uh, indeed should be a P. Okay, so when in the asymptotic limit, when N is really large, this should be um, like this. And so th this is basically the, the result uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> yet, this is really only asymptotically uh, uh, correct, so that you really need to go to a very large n, uh, when you don't, and typically, uh, we're not in this uh, limit. <clears throat> so if, um, um, in that case, basically, you need to correct uh, this limit with something that, is, uh, that depends on, on, on n, uh, and here I, I just write it as a normalization factor. So what we will like to look at is the normalized maximum likelihood, <coughs> which is defined uh, this way. Now, uh, you have different ways to uh, correct for this uh, asymptotic uh, um, um, dependency on n. Uh, the most well-known way is the BIC, that's the Bayesian Information Criterion. Uh, and that's really the, the correct uh, asymptotic limit. So when n uh, goes to infinity, uh, <coughs> this uh, should behave like this, where uh, here is the number of parameters of uh, your uh, distribution Q. But in fact, this is uh, typically, uh, typically we're still very far from this asymptotic limit <coughs> because we don't have, you know, uh, Avogadro numbers of uh, uh, experiments, <coughs> except maybe in physics, but uh, in, in, in biology or, or, or um, clinical research, you have, uh, you're happy if you have a few hundred uh, patients. So we are really far from this limit, in fact. So in, for, for this, you need to develop more uh, accurate uh, um, corrections um, uh, asymptotically, and, and one, then one that we've used and developed in the recent year is this normalized maximum likelihood where you, in fact, uh, uh, look at all, the, all possible data sets. So it's kind of a universal uh, um, uh, corrections where you look at all data sets. So you normalize over all data sets of the same length. So it can be a quite a sh a small n. <coughs> all right. Um, and so the, the, maybe the second slide and, and final slide for this information uh, uh, primer is um, <clears throat> so uh, concerned 
you know, emphasizing these multivariate. So before, uh, I, I didn't mention it, but x really is a vector. So that's, uh, that's all the different uh, variables of our network. <coughs> but if you really want to uh, make it explicit, uh, <coughs> then, um, you know, this uh, Shannon entropy, um, uh, you can write it as a, you know, multivariate uh, function this way. And that's the definition. Um, now the entropy, when variables are completely independent, so the, the, the entropy of uh, two nodes is the same of their joint entropy. Uh, so H, uh, X, I, U, I is the same as the sum of these two. So in that case, this should be zero. So <coughs> uh, when, it, when they are not independent, then the difference of this, uh, between these terms, the, the, the separate and the joint entropy, is defined something that is called the mutual information. And this mutual information, you can uh, you know, generalize it to um, more than two points. So we can add one third point, and by the same kind of uh, construct, which is the based on the inclusion exclusion principle, you can uh, define multivariate uh, information uh, through uh, combinations with, with alternative sign of uh, entropy. <coughs> um, uh, one can also define a conditional entropy. So if I, <coughs> so maybe I should uh, draw uh, the diagram. Uh, so that's my two variables, <coughs> x, y. And so uh, this kind of an uh, ensemble uh, view of it, uh, <coughs> my uh, cycles are the, the entropy of the separate variables, and <clears throat> if they are really independent, these two guys are separate, and so the, the, the joy entropy is the same as the sum of the two. Uh, okay. Uh, but then if they overlap, the overlap is, uh, is this, uh, Mutual information, okay. And then, as I see, I can I can also define what is called the uh, conditional entropy. <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yes, it's correct. Sorry. <coughs> uh, which obeys this uh, this formula, okay. <coughs> so. I can also define the conditional mutual information, um, which is exactly the same formula, just condition on the, uh, the condition variable. And oh, oh, um, I'll leave you as an exercise um, to see that uh, when I write this plus uh, this, <coughs> this term plus this term, um, the terms depending on A kind of magically uh, cancelled and uh, give me the mutual information. So you see that there is some sort of relations between the different multivariate informations defined as uh, like this and the conditional uh, multivariate information. So what it means is that when I have two points, x and y, I can always introduce any third point, A, and split this um, mutual information in two parts. One part that uh, uh, with a contribution of A, so that's kind of the indirect path, indirect uh, contribution of A to the two-point mutual information, and the, and the rest, 
<coughs> uh, this is the contribution that is independent of A. So maybe the direct connections or some, con some uh, other indirect contributions, N but not from uh, A. Uh, okay, so with this, I think I can uh, <coughs> try to introduce you the, the basic of the method that we've developed. Uh, so if we if we go back to uh, sorry uh, our slides here the maximum likelihood the normalized maximum likelihood um, and we apply this formula to uh, Bayesian graphs what we will uh, find is the following so we will find that this maximum likelihood um, <coughs> is defined through this uh, conditional mutual information so. What it means is that uh, each edge that I remove, so this, this is sum over all the edges that I've removed in my graph. So the kind of a vision of uh, this constraint-based method. So each time I remove an edge, <coughs> um, it comes with a, um, a decrease in the likelihood, uh, as you mentioned early on, because this is always positive. So the condition mutual information is always positive. <coughs> um, <coughs> so my likelihood, because of this sign, is decreasing. Um, but that's only true in the infinite uh, um, <coughs> uh, data size limit. Uh, when it's not infinite, then uh, in fact these uh, corrections, this normalization is decreasing even faster. So what it means is that really uh, my likelihood is not decreasing, it's increasing, okay, when I remove edges because of the finite size of the data set. So, but obviously I'd like to remove all the edges for which this uh, conditional mutual information is uh, as small as possible. If I pick an edge, a very important edge, I have a huge cost here. Uh, you know, if this is very far from zero, I have a huge cost, and so this is a very bad idea to remove an essential edge of my graph. So I, 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 what I'd like to do is to remove all the edges, you know, the, the useless edges uh, that have very small contribution, close to zero, okay? And that, that will, uh, n even, even though they, they are still s small and positive, that won't decrease my likelihood because of this normalization. Um, all right, <clears throat> so the idea of, the, of our approach is, is the following. U using these relations between uh, multivariate uh, information, uh, you know, for each pair of variables x and y, what we will do um, is we will try to find the strongest strong contributors to this uh, uh, mutual information. <clears throat> so we'll find the, the one that is the strongest, so that has the largest three-point material information. And then we subtract this uh, contribution of uh, A1 uh, to the initial two-point information. <clears throat> so that will give us something like a conditional meter information. Um, if there is only one indirect path, uh, this should be close to zero after I, I subtracted uh, this um, three-point contribution. Um, but if I have uh, several in, uh, you know, indirect paths, um, although this is, I believe, a strong contribution, so the, this is not noise, this is uh, real information in my data, um, what I found is that uh, this is not enough to explain all the dependencies between X and Y, and I have, uh, you know, I have some uh, residual conditional mutual information that remains. So at this stage, I can try to find a second best contributor and subtract it, condition on the first one, and then you know I'll go. I can just iterate this. And the idea is, you know, eventually the the goal is the same: is to try to find conditional independencies, but not uh, you know randomly and by just picking some. Uh, uh, odd combinations of variables that just happen to cancel this uh, uh, conditional return information, uh, but really by collecting 
uh, significant contributors that are not noise, um, one by one, until maybe I find conditional independences, but I don't know initially. So I can, I can still find strong contributors without uh, getting independences at the end. Uh, okay, and so then I have to decide whether this is uh, small enough. <clears throat> and for this, uh, basically I, I, I just have to include these uh, finite size corrections to my uh, uh, information, conditional information. So, so basically I can put this into, uh, into my exponential up there. And that, that amounts to, uh, you know, including some correction. In the big uh, formalism, it's of the order of log n over n. <coughs> uh, um, and so this is kind of the, my uh, finite size corrections to mutual information. This is always positive, but when the corrected values becomes negative, it means that uh, basically I have found something that uh, uh, looks um, uh, in conditionally independent, given the data that I have. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's when uh, this is negative. When this is positive, when this uh, corrected uh, conditional mutual information is positive, uh, then I keep the edge, but I have some sort of, uh, uh, it gives me some sort of confidence of uh, the, you know, keeping the edge on this graph. So I can define something like a, a edge specific con confidence ratio uh, um, that uh, comes from the prob probability to remove this edge in, in the graph. Okay, so that's the, the sum up of our approach. So you, again, it's a kind of conditional, uh, a constraint based approach. So you start from a complete graph, uh, you prune as many edges based on conditional independencies, but this conditional independency will try to find them in a robust way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then we have to orient. So the orientations, they are based on the sign of this three-point uh, information. So uh, unlike two-point information or two-point conditional information that are always positive, uh, three-point um, information can be positive or negative. When they are negative, it means that this is really not a contribution. And so it means that you found some kind of V structure. <clears throat> uh, so that's how we orient the V structures based on the sign of this uh, three point information. And when this is positive, you can uh, propagate further down this uh, uh, V structure orientation. So that's, the, that's it. <clears throat> So before we go to some applications, let me show you the you know how this method performs on on benchmarks. So when we actually know for sure what the how the data was generated, um, and that's uh, three benchmarks here. So uh, these are three um, uh, benchmark of uh, increasing uh, uh, difficulty. So the, the first one here is a simple uh, graph with about 500 parameters. Uh, <clears throat> the second one is a bit more difficult graph with uh, um, 1,000 parameters. And the last one is kind of tricky a graph with 100,000 parameters. <clears throat> uh, so our method, uh, MIC, uh, is in, in warm color here. Uh, the, the shade of color corresponds to uh, the, the, you know, the presence of a latent variable. So basically we generate this data with a Bayesian graph, but then we hide a fraction of these nodes. So from zero to 20% of these nodes in this example. And then we try to reconstruct this graph by hiding some of the generating uh, variable. So as you see, uh, so on top is the F score. So F score is kind of a compromise between precision and, and recall. So when you have a F score of one, it really means that uh, you reconstructed the, this network perfectly. So we're not quite there, but uh, not far actually for this uh, simple uh, graph. Uh, and as you see, uh, when you hide more and more variables, uh, you 
you do uh, worse, but uh, not that worse, actually. So we, we can indeed uh, uh, reconstruct graphs where some of the generated uh, variables are hidden from you, so are not uh, observed, and that's obviously important because typically in some applications you never observe all variables. Um, <clears throat> and in blue, in blue colors, uh, this is the state-of-the-art uh, constraint-based method not using information at all. So, uh, as you see, you know, for simple graphs, uh, eventually um, it catches up. I mean, it, we obtain almost the same uh, result. Um, but, uh, as you see, this is in log scale, so that's the number of samples you allow yourself to look at. And basically, you need almost 100 times more sample to reach the same result. Uh, so what it means, obviously, is that looking at information in data, uh, you, you, you gain, you gain uh, a lot uh, uh, as compared to just uh, randomly uh, uh, trying to find conditional dependencies. Uh, on, 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 more, on more slightly more difficult uh, examples, uh, we we do uh, uh, a bit uh, <coughs> worse. And finally, on very difficult examples, uh, we do uh, even worse, um, but as you see, uh, much better than the classical methods, in particular because their, their uh, running time is, uh, is um, much slower. So it's basically quadratic for the classical methods and linear for uh, our methods. <coughs> um, so here, obviously, it's not perfect. Uh, 0.5 uh, f-score is not so great, but uh, we have to guess uh, more or less uh, 100,000 parameters, and here we restrict ourselves to 50,000 samples. So in principle, if we would, we haven't done it, but we, you know, if you increase the number of samples, we would hope that we'll still be able to get some uh, information from this data. Uh, um, let me finish on the, the, the complexity of the algorithm, not in terms of samples that we just saw, uh, which is linear in number of samples, but in terms of the size of the network. Uh, and here, the, on this plot, you see that uh, it scales uh, essentially quadratically in terms in term of uh, uh, variables, which obviously expected because we look at all pairs. <clears throat> and we do uh, essentially uh, uh, same thing, including or excluding latent variable, which is also a major difference with the classical methods. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's try to uh, see uh, a few applications. Um, so this first example uh, comes from uh, data sets uh, from this cosmic database. So this is a cancer uh, um, data set, <clears throat> and that's an interesting data set because here it uh, uh, gives you um, uh, information on the mutation, expression, and ploidy of the, tum of the, the, the cells in, in different tumors. So we have about 800 samples, which is, uh, so that corresponds to patients, yeah? Breast cancer patient. Um, and we look at more or less um, 90 genes. So this is the graph. So all so the the the, the green dots corresponds to expression uh, nodes. So they are the, the expression of the corresponding genes, um, about 90 or so. Uh, <clears throat> and for the same genes, we also have the mutation. So as you see, the mutations they correspond to the yellow dots. And we, on the, the final graph, we have very few uh, yellow dots, which means that, in fact, there are very few mutations that are connected to the rest of the graph, uh, about, except for, for a few that I'll describe in a second. Uh, and then you have a, a single node, which is a ploidy here. Um, <clears throat> so ploidy is uh, the number of uh, um, copies of chromosome that you have uh, in your cell. So most of our cells are diploid, so we have two copies of uh, our chromosomes and all our genes. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, during uh, tumor progression, uh, some cells can become tetraploid. So they have uh, you know, four copies of all their uh, chromosomes. 
uh, you can typically uh, you have just a few of these cells in a, in a tumor, uh, but the problem is that under treatment, uh, these few cells they are typically uh, you know much more likely to find a way uh, to resist the treatment. So you know they have four copies of all their genes. So basically they can do a lot with their genome. They can cut pieces and, and glue pieces together. They can uh, uh, <coughs> really uh, uh, get rid of all chunk of uh, uh, DNA in their uh, uh, tetraploid genomes. And this give, uh, give them a, a, you know, a lead on finding a way to uh, resist treatment. So, uh, typically, you know, although there are very few cells initially under treatment, it is almost as if the treatment, the drug, chemotherapy, would select those uh, uh, clones that uh, will eventually resist uh, uh, the treatment. <clears throat> so eventually, uh, you can have um, a serious problem because now your initial tumor that, uh, you know, most of it responded well to treatment, so all the diploid cells were uh, 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 killed by the treatment, but then the treatment also selected uh, the, the problem that uh, uh, eventually might resist treatment and leads to metastasis. So in, the, in these particular examples, about half of the uh, samples comes from, uh, uh, you know, had gone through a tetraploid uh, uh, stage. So as you see, tetraploid should be four. Uh, this uh, uh, um, peak here is not quite at, as at four, as you realize, and this is due to this uh, um, genome instability. So tetraploid cells, they, they kind of uh, become instable, their genome become instable. <clears throat> but clearly you can see there are still uh, uh, two populations of cells here. Okay, when you look at the, 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 you know, the correlations between the ploidy of the tumor and the, the expression of genes, you see that many genes are affected. Uh, either overexpression or underexpression. Uh, but then, as you see in the graph, in the reconstructed graph, you see that ploidy is not directly connected to most of this uh, gene expression. So that, that's exactly what we mentioned initially. So these networks, the idea is to disentangle direct from indirect effect. And here it seems that most of this effect that you can observe is not direct, directly linked to ploidy. <coughs> And uh, f except for one, which is uh, actually uh, well known uh, in the literature, so that makes complete sense here. Um, um, <clears throat> so what we observe is that the ploidy affects the, the expression of many genes, but through uh, uh, an intermediate node, which is the mutation of a particular gene, P53, which I'm sure you've heard of already, which uh, in fact plays among many things, the role of uh, ploidy uh, uh, um, chain points uh, keeper. So, as long, you know, when your p53 is not mutated, that function properly, then the, uh, tetraploid cells will be eliminated from the, the tumor. So it's only when you uh, uh, start to mess up with these uh, genes that um, tetraploid cells can accumulate. So obviously. Nothing is uh, really uh, connected to gene expression unless uh, p53 is mutated. And this, 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 um, the approach recover this well-known result. So there is no nothing new here, but it's kind of uh, illustrative of the of the the whole these uh, network uh, approaches. Uh, yes. This is a bit counterintuitive as p53 is a tumor suppressor. So you would expect like having more copy of p53. But it's a tumor suppressor through this ploidy stuff? Or it's also so a tumor P53, suppressor? P53 has many functions. So in, in some context, it's a tumor suppressor, as you, you said. But it's also, uh, it's also oncogenes in some other. Uh, uh, so it's, it has many roles. And here, definitely, it has a, a, it's, it's through its role of a ploidy uh, check keeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's very interesting. People with trisomy 21 yeah. uh, have a kind of protection against cancer, and they have this recopy of P53, which is in, in, in chromosome 21. So it's okay. quite a bit counterintuitive for me. But okay, great. 
Okay, so, so here it's not just, the, it's actually not the copy of the, the expression, it's really the mutations. So whether yeah. this gene is uh, functional or not. Yeah, yeah but in, in mm. this rapport itself, we expect it to be more present still, even if you yeah. have nobody's from in the network. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's really the, 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 here it's specifically through mutation. So that, that's one of uh, another aspect. Here you, you distinguish expression level from mutations. That there are different distinct nodes. So basically we have one node for mutations here and one node for expression here. Okay. okay? And BRCA1? Uh, BRCA1, is it here? Uh, I forgot. So I have to look. <laughs> we, can, we can check afterwards. <coughs> um, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I follow your, your question exactly. Uh, here, what, what, what I... Yes, yes. Yes, so the, the mutation, what I was trying to uh, uh, um, emphasize is that the mutation of P53 basically allow these tetraploid clone cells to be around. Uh, otherwise, they, they are eliminated by these ploidy checkpoints. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have ploidy checkpoints uh, you know, during development, uh, each time you duplicate your cell, you have to replicate your genome, so each, each cells at each uh, uh, replication goes to this uh, tetraploid state. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't segregate, it's uh, four copies into two uh, separate uh, diploid uh, cells, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're in trouble. So there, there is this checkpoint, ploidy checkpoint that is very important that uh, plays its role as it should at each uh, cell division. Uh, when it works, this problem really does not exist. That, that's, that's what I, I was uh, trying to explain. Mm. But you, you, you are. So it's, 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 it, yeah, it's not linked to, to tetraploidy in, the, in that case. So if you overexpress uh, non gene, mm -hmm. you know, in a d normal diploid cells, tumor cells, if you overexpress oncogenes, you get cancer. It's not related to ploidy in that case. So I think, I think mm -hmm. what is a bit difficult for biologists <laughs> is that it, it's it, trying to find causal relation, not correlation. I think it's maybe what is a, a bit different for, for us. Yes. Um, okay, so that was ploidy in, uh, in tumor, as we just discussed. But in fact, there is an interesting parallel of uh, what we just uh, discussed in tumor. So, um, you know, this dynamic of uh, dynamics of tetraploid tumors in the course of uh, cancer progression and treatment. <coughs> And, uh, uh, you know, what happens on much, much longer time scales, so this, this occurs over a month or a few years, <coughs> but on much longer time scales, on evolution time scales, so here we are talking about 100 million years, uh, there is a, you know, this kind of dynamics is mirrored by the, what happens uh, 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 during evolution where you, definitely had, uh, you know, um, uh, success uh, uh, stories from tetraploid species. Um, <clears throat> so in particular, all vertebrates, 
including us. So we all descend from a single species that uh, underwent whole genome duplication twice, actually, almost 500 million years ago. And uh, um, so there is argument in the field, but uh, uh, there is roughly the same idea that you know these tetrapod species. In fact, initially they have many burden to overcome, and typically they they are eliminated. Uh, by evolution, but from time to time, and possibly uh, related to uh, major environmental uh, changes, these uh, species have a uh, you know, uh, way uh, around some uh, sudden changes in the, the environment, and they are kind of much better at uh, uh, resisting, um, for instance, major uh, extinction events. <clears throat> It's kind of a, a hypothesis still, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's rather uh, uh, likely. So in fact, if w when you look at the tree of life, uh, <clears throat> so this is all, uh, another topic of uh, interest of the group here, and so we started that some more than 10 years ago. When you look at the tree of life, um, <clears throat> indeed um, many species, uh, 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 eukaryote species, underwent these uh, uh, whole genome duplications sometimes they're there in their past. So for instance, for vertebrates, we just said it, we had these two rounds of whole genome duplication about 500 million years ago. Um, uh, fish, for instance, uh, most of fish, <coughs> uh, current fish, extant fish, uh, all comes from a single species that underwent the third whole genome duplication so about 300 million years ago. Um, <coughs> You see that plants are very good at uh, accumulating uh, whole genome duplications, even protists and uh, invertebrates also. For instance, uh, recently there was this discovery that uh, uh, there was a whole genome duplication before the split between a scorpion and spiders, for instance. It's almost as old as the one in vertebrates. <coughs> um, so if you're interested in, in this, uh, uh, okay, and so, so the, the whole idea it was initially uh, 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 hypothesized by o Susumu Ono, a geneticist in the, you know, in the late 60s, in fact, and for 40 years or so, he was uh, kind of uh, 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 <coughs> not really taken seriously, uh, although eventually uh, now we, we well, all agree, I would say, or almost all agree that uh, he was right. <clears throat> um, um, so recently we, we, we sort of, um, okay, no, so what, what I should have said is that after whole genome duplication, uh, if you wait long enough, so long is really long, like 100 million years, uh, then most of this uh, uh, redundancy is lost. Uh, so 90% of these uh, duplicates coming from whole genome duplication, they, 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 they are lost. And so this is a problem because in fact very few remains and it's typical, difficult to, to identify those analog genes. So that, that's what we've uh, de we developed a method to do that and if you're interested you can have a look at this uh, server and web page. Now it's, uh, we, we identify analogs in about 27 uh, vertebrate species. So why did we uh, do that and, and took uh, some effort to identify these uh, analog genes? Well, this is because, in fact, they are uh, rather different duplicates. So if you look at the whole uh, human genome, about half of the genes have been duplicated, but independently from one another. So like kind of the classical uh, duplication events. Um, and a, a third or a quarter of the genes have retained these uh, analog copies from the uh, you know, 500 million years old uh, whole genome duplication. But as you see, uh, the overlap between the two is very small. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, also in terms of function, uh, um, these are different gene families. So the gene families that accumulated uh, small-scale duplicates, they are typically uh, immune or sensory response genes, while the analogs um, are enriched in um, development, signaling, uh, regulations. So that, that, that has been known for, for a while, yes? And um, can you date 
the duplication, even the small scale duplication, and compare yeah. because it, is this also uh, like a, an effect of the age of the duplication? Yeah, I don't think I have the slides, but I, I'll I refer to. So we we, we got a, a paper in PLOS uh, Computational Biology f uh, in 2014 that uh, mentioned ages like this. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so here, uh, okay. Um, so, um, so obviously there is a, okay. There, so there, there is a. Um, so basically, uh, here's uh, you know the selection of uh, duplicates uh, clearly depends on the mode of duplication. So typically in evolution, you listen that you know the mutations or um, <coughs> the 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 trigger is uh, completely at random. Okay, and then you selection uh, act on it and you either keep or don't keep. So obviously here what you realize is that uh, the trigger duplication uh, will have a strong effect on the outcome. So if uh, certain genes will tend to retain small scale duplicates, although small scale duplicates they occur everywhere at random, but only certain genes will turn to keep them. And, and, and the same for analogs. So uh, analog they've been so all genes are duplicated at once, obviously, when you duplicate the whole genomes, but certain families will retain those uh, duplicates much better than others. So the, the, the duplication mode obviously has a strong um, impact on the, the eventual selection of these genes. <clears throat> so obviously uh, any explanation of this uh, phenomenon has to take into account the mode of duplication. <clears throat> um, and what we, we, we uh, found so that, that's the paper I, I was mentioning. Uh, what we found is that uh, the, the retention of analogs is um, related to the uh, uh, susceptibility to uh, um, uh, deleterious uh, mutations and in particular dominant mutations. <clears throat> so the more a gene uh, is susceptible to uh, deleterious dominant mutations, <clears throat> the more it has uh, retained uh, analog copies, which is, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, it's kind of uh, bizarre because uh, it means that vertebrates uh, have uh, accumulated uh, genes that are you know, really triggering a serious genetic disease. So we have uh, typically uh, you know, three or four times more of these genes that in vertebrates, for instance, so we, although we don't have that many more genes than in vertebrates. So we kind of retain the problematic genes, and um, and what, what, what it means is that uh, in, in you know to make a long story sh short, what it means is that the retention of analogs is not based on adaptation. So adaptation works for SSD. So for the immune and sensory response, it's really adaptation. It's because you know, keep having multiple copies of certain genes make you fitter uh, to, you know, for in the immune or sensory response context uh, that you have accumulated these uh, small scale duplicates. For analog duplicates, it's not that. <clears throat> it's not because it makes you fitter. It's because it's a problem to get rid of those genes once you've, uh, um, uh, you've had a whole genome duplication. <clears throat> and so you tend it to retain uh, the genes that are the most problematic to get rid of because when you mutate them, basically you get cancer to, to be a, <coughs> kind of, to kind of oversimplify the, this idea. <coughs> okay, um, so, and we, we uh, also discovered that it's really uh, uh, related to the dominance of these uh, mutations. Um, um, <coughs> So there is a proper uh, uh, population genetics way to interpret this result. Uh, if you're interested, you can have a look at it. Um, and it says that uh, basically analogs are retained through a purifying selection, which is a certain mode of uh, selection, while SSD are uh, um, <coughs> really retained by uh, uh, adaptation, positive selection. <coughs> But here I'd like to uh, not, I won't really describe this kind of uh, classical approach, but I, I'd like to show you that basically you can recover or, or back this uh, uh, 
uh, first principle uh, uh, population genetics model approach by uh, graphical models. So where if you ignore everything about population genetics, maybe most of you ignore everything about population genetics. So here we just look, like to look at the data and, and see what they can tell us, okay? And so obviously what here we're interested in is to look at the connections between this susceptibility to disease, like uh, dominant mutation, cancer, and so on. And the fact that some genes have been duplicate, duplicated, uh, and as we just saw, we'd like to differentiate the small scale and the whole genome duplication. Uh, so that's, that we'd like to understand how these properties are connected. So this will be the node of our network, causal network, and the data, so the samples to reconstruct this uh, network, in that case will be the genes themselves. So before, as you realize, the genes were the nodes of our network, and now the genes will be the, the samples. Okay, and the nodes will be the gene properties, okay? <clears throat> and so when you do that, this is the kind of graph that you obtain, and uh, this result, in fact, really confirm, or, or, you know, but obviously completely independently from uh, first principle uh, uh, um, theoretical approach, uh, the fact that the retention of analogs is it's, it's basically uh, controlled by the dominance of the mutation in these genes and also some other properties like the autoinhibition that I didn't have time to, to discuss. <clears throat> and, um, and obviously that, that's what we, we, we proposed, but uh, obviously when you have many more properties, you can also look at how other properties are connected directly or indirectly to uh, uh, the retention of analogs and in, in particular, we did not find any direct connections between the fact that certain genes are involved in complexes and the retention of analogs, which had been for a long time the you know, main hypothesis in the, in the field. There is some connection, correlations between these two, but it's completely indirect. <clears throat> um, all right, so how long uh, do I still have? So, so I'll try to, um, in the last few minutes, I'll try to go to more complex example, um, um, in particular clinical data. So everything I said so far concern a kind of simple data sets where all the, the data was uh, discretized, either, either discrete or discretized. <coughs> uh, but in principle, you have data sets where you have really a continuous uh, um, uh, value of some variables and maybe a mixed uh, uh, data sets where some variables are continuous and some are discrete and you'd, you'd like to analyze them through the same sort of methods. And in principle you can because uh, mutual information and all uh, multivariate information that we uh, introduce, uh, you can define them you know, for continuous variable and basically what it means is that if you have an, enough data then you make uh, smaller and smaller bins, and then eventually uh, you get a good estimate of the, <coughs> the information, mutual information between those variables. So that's the theory. Uh, in practice, though, uh, there is again a problem with the finite size. So because you don't have infinite amount of data, when you do this uh, process of uh, you know, uh, adding more and more bins to analyze your data, um, initially, when you put very few bins, uh, you often, uh, you know, underestimate uh, the information between them. So when you don't know how to discretize data and you assume, well, let's put two or three bins, uh, basically, typically, you have a rather bad estimates of your information in the data. But then the problem is when you increase the number of bins at some point, you miss, without really realizing it, you miss the, the good estimates and you go to, uh, <coughs> uh, you now overestimate your information by basically putting all samples in, uh, in uh, um, single bins. <coughs> so that's, that's, that's the problem. Uh, so here you are doing basically underfitting and here you're doing overfitting and uh, you'd like to, 
try to guess this. <clears throat> so in order to do that, what we propose is the following. So we propose just to include this finite sex correction that I introduced early on uh, in this mutual information. And so now uh, the idea is when you, you know, when you increase the number of beans too much, this penalty <coughs> will in fact make this uh, um, I prime decrease instead of going there. You can prove this. Uh, and so obviously our guess is that the best estimate should correspond more or less to the maximum of this I prime. Uh, um, okay, so that's, that's what we, that's what we, we like to do. <clears throat> but now obviously we need to find this maximum. Uh, so we were inspired actually by a, a very interesting paper <clears throat> that does this but for just one variable. So for an histogram you can uh, let's imagine that we have uh, some data coming from this uh, uh, distribution with two close peaks. If you only look at 100 samples, then you can find, I mean, basically you don't have enough samples to uh, uh, distinguish between these two peaks and you put three bins. Uh, uh, but now if you go to 1,000 samples, now you, you, know, you start to see clearly the two peaks and, and so you now go to eight or, or nine bins. Uh, and these people uh, showed that uh, you can do that rather efficiently. So you can find the, the optimum number of beans and their, their cut points in some, uh, with some reasonably uh, complexity algorithms, so polynomial algorithm in, in n cube. <coughs> uh, our problem is that we don't have just one variable, we have two or more variables, as you saw. So we had to adapt this, and we, so we basically want to estimate this conditional mutual information. Um, and so we, we, we have some method that uh, kind of is kind of a heuristics, uh, but uh, uh, works quite well, as you will see in a second. And it's uh, even faster than the, this method. So it's uh, in, in quadratic now. <coughs> so when I look at two variables, x and ui, the first thing is if I keep the same x and I change my ui, uh, oh no, sorry. So that's, that's not this. So if I look at very few samples, sorry, that's uh, the same x and ui here. This, the, so if I have very few samples, I have a number of beans here. And if I have much more samples, I have many more beans, as they expected. <coughs> now if I look, uh, as I was saying, at the same x, it's kind of uniform here, but with very different uis, um, then obviously I see that the, the optimum discretization for x is depends on the UI I'm looking at. So that's kind of a problem because I can't really discretize beforehand all my continuous variable. I have to do it every time I look at my data. So when I look at X and UI, I have to look at X in a way that is different from a different UI. So what it means, you really have to find an efficient way to optimize these um, uh, mutual information estimates. <coughs> um, um, the nice thing is that with this approach, uh, when you have independencies, which is all what we do, basically we find, try to find conditional or, or, non, or unconditional dependencies, the nice uh, thing is that uh, our estimates uh, goes to zero exactly. So to go to zero exactly, it's really when you decide that you have not enough information in this data to put two bins on each variable. So when you don't have enough information, then you decide to put a single bin because it's better, it's, uh, it gives you a higher result uh, than uh, two bins. Um, and so as soon as you put just one bin, you get exactly zero. So this method is nice because it's also, it, it, it works as an independent test. So typical methods, which are the k nearest neighbor methods here, so you have a hyperparameter uh, that uh, varies the results slightly, so they, they, they work uh, very well too. But you still need, uh, you know, a, a, you know an independent test at the end to decide whether uh, uh, these two variables are really independent or not. In our case, uh, basically the error goes to zero. Um, so the estimate gives us the independent test uh, uh, <coughs> for free. Um, Okay, that's some benchmark on some networks. I don't think I have time to detail much uh, benchmark. Um, 
you also have we also have a server um, that uh, uh, allows you to do it with your own data. <coughs> um, so you have a bunch of uh, <coughs> options. So you have to pick your data sets. You can uh, uh <coughs> upload uh, additional files to better display. You have a confidence uh, cut related to the confidence ratio I mentioned earlier. Uh, okay, and then you run your data set. So it's pretty fast, but still I have to uh, accelerate it. So after, in this example, a couple of minutes, you'll see in a second that you obtain a, a network uh, here about 100 something nodes. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's really dark for some reason. Um, so that, that's the network you, you obtain. <coughs> then you have all sort of uh, button on the edge to uh, filter more or, or emphasize. You can click on some nodes to uh, see the neighborhood. <coughs> you can look at distributions. So you can look back at the data. I'll discuss this uh, data set in a second. Uh, <coughs> you can uh, compare the distributions of uh, variables. So here it's two discrete variables. You can look at two. Uh, continuous or mixed uh, edges between uh, continuous and, and discrete. <coughs> uh, yes? So I was wondering, so Bayesian methods typically for directed graphs, they cannot deal with sidewalls in the graph. But I have seen in a few slides ago that some of your graphs have sidewalls. Yes. Graphs, so how this method uh, performs when you have sidewalls? Um, so the method assumes that there is no cycles, but sometimes uh, give you cycles at the end. So there, there are kind of inconsistencies in, in this approach. Um, and um, yeah, that's the, it's not often uh, mentioned. So these constraint-based methods, they have this problem. Uh, they, they may give you cycles at the end. Unlike a search and score, because here you restrict yourself to a proper graph, um, but constraint-based, they, they assume that there is no cycle, but you, you can eventually find cycles at the end, yeah. And I was wondering, because I realize that's a problem of many probabilistic methods, but I was wondering, have you computed the loss of performance that because of the cycles, maybe on some synthetic data sets? No, the, the, the answer is no, we haven't really... Uh... <clears throat> All right. Um... Okay, so that's the, the graph that we just uh, saw. Um, at the end of my time, yeah, so I'll, I'll finish with this example. <coughs> um, um, so this is the cancer uh, <coughs> data sets from the Institute Curie. Um, so there are many uh, variables that have been, so they, they, these are data collected from medical records of about uh, 1,200 patients from the, the hospital. And uh, so you have, uh, you know, many informations that are related to other disease, so that there are communications, comorbidity communications here. Um, uh, okay, so that's kind of complex network. So initially what you have to find is that uh, uh, the obvious, you recover what is known, the obvious, let's say. So the number of communications obviously is uh, defined by the other uh, um, so the number of com comorbidities, the, the other disease that this patient may have, is obviously uh, connected to the, the other disease, as expected. The metastases are connected to the, uh, <coughs> the, the organs where these metastases um, occur, and so on. Um, you recover the obvious uh, connections between uh, you know, BMI and age, and, and so on. Uh, you know, metastasis and, 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 and survival. So all the obvious uh, connections uh, you recover, but there are also uh, unexpected, there was also unexpected results. For instance, in, in this example, the center uh, node, which is uh, related to the hospital where these patients were treated, uh, was not really expected uh, to be a major <coughs> uh, node in this network, but that's actually the most connected node. So there, there is a, you know, clearly a bias on the hospital, and uh, 
And this is due to different things. So the, these patients have different uh, clinical profile. From uh, so this is both hospitals are, are from Institut Curie, either in Paris or, or Saint Cloud. And but clearly the patients have uh, been selected on, on slightly different criteria, and this obviously shows up in the statistics. Um, um, this is also due to clinical practice. You know, these uh, medical doctors are not the same, so the, these patients are treated differently. Doesn't mean they are treated worse or, or better, but basically differently, and this obviously shows up uh, in these uh, graphs. Um, <clears throat> one thing, interesting thing we, we, we found is that uh, the, there is a continuous uh, variable, RCB, which is, um, um, we, we realize the, 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 the best pronostic uh, uh, score that uh, will uh, tell you whether these patients will eventually uh, have a metastasis. <clears throat> so typically this is not the score that is uh, used um, uh, as such, but uh, the, the clinician will use a discretized version of this RCB, which is called the PCR, pathological complete response, which corresponds to uh, RCB equals zero. So when you basically don't have uh, cancer cells, you, you're after chemotherapy, um, then uh, your, the pronostic is very good, indeed. Uh, but the, the point is that if, if you have a RCB that is not exactly zero, uh, sometimes your chances are as good as uh, if it was zero. And, and, and this is actually missed in, in, in most uh, cases because uh, in most, um, um, uh, yeah, in most cases, and that's kind of a problem because this PCR is basically used to assess whether a new treatment or, or some changes in the uh, uh, care path of a patient uh, uh, improves or not their, their, their survival. And uh, indeed, we, we see that this is not really directly related to su survival. Uh, the reason is that basically the, this RCB, uh, uh, this, these are the two distribution of RCB depending on survival of patient. And what we realize is that uh, basically we should not look at this RCB as zero or non-zero, but rather uh, uh, discretize this RCB score in three categories, low RCB, including zero, for which indeed the survival uh, pronostic is uh, good. <coughs> but not better at uh, zero than 0.5, so it's exactly the same, in fact. Um, and then you have a middle-range RCB where the pronostic is more problematic and eventually a, a, a bad pronostic RCB for very high, high RCB. <clears throat> um, but then, uh, looking at this network, we also found that there are other nodes that are not included in the RCB or PCR indeed, that are even more informative on the survival of patients. And that's, in that case, the uh, uh, post-chemotherapy um, mitotic index that uh, tells you about the proliferation of the cells after uh, chemotherapy. <clears throat> and so obviously now we'd like to include those in our scores. Um, okay, that's the second example, but I think I don't have time, so I will switch this and I'll flash my last uh, uh, slide. Thank you. Cool. <laughs>